Hey up and welcome to another episode of Last Cast. Today you join us in North Yorkshire on the River Nid, just at Moormonkton. We've actually fished just downstream here before, fishing on the whip and fishing sort of similar to this, but we've come up at a different time of year this time round, middle of summer. The water's well down, so we've, as you can see, we're on a bit of an awkward peg, sat well up on the banking. Um, but I'm going to use similar sort of tactics to what we did in the previous, previous episode we did on this river. I'm going to fish a whip line at sort of three and a half or three metres on the whip, dead in front of me on ground bait. There's a decent depth there, which I've plumbed up and found about probably five foot of water, which is just about right. So my plan of attack there is going to be trying to catch a few days early, and then once the days back off and that sort of dies off, I'm going to try and chase them down the peg using a stick float and possibly even fish a bomb to the far bank under those trees for a few better fish towards the back end of the session. So the odds are with today's, today's episode that we're going to have to split it into two because it is going to be quite in depth. And like I say, that's going to be my plan of attack. In terms of bait, I've kept things dead simple and gone down sort of a natural bait route, your typical river baits. I've got some decent dendrobenas, again, like I say, for chucking on the bomb down towards the features. I've got two pints of red maggots, again, for the stick float. Two pints of hemp, which you know, if, um, if the fishing's really good, I can really pile the hemp in and sort of build a bed of bait down there. Um, so that's going to be pretty much the basis of the feed. I've got a few casts and a few dead maggots, and I'm just going to feed those in the ground bait on the whip line. Uh, the ground bait I've chosen for the whip is equal parts brown crumb, census black magic and census river. So a nice heavy mix, really sticky. I'm going to be looking to feed less ground bait because the river's clear. I want to just use the ground bait purely to bind like the casters and the dead maggots together. Get them to the bottom and pin the fish in one area rather than having them scatter and chase down the peg. Because obviously when you whip fishing, you can't really follow them down. So like I say, that's the plan of attack today. In terms of the rigs I'm going to use, I've got two whips set up, like I say, three and a half metres and three metres, um, pr pretty much identical in the construction, the only difference being the sort of bottom end of the rig in the presentation. So in terms of the whips, I've got Daewa um, speed whips. Like I say, you'll see me use these on plenty of videos and you know, I think they're a brilliant piece of kit for the price. In terms of the main line, I've got 013 Guru N-Gage and on this one I've got an 011 hook length to a size 18 Drenum wide gate match, so quite a positive rig, um, a gram and a half float, it's a sense of sort of carrot pattern, um, really good, nice pronounced shoulder on it, so ideal for holding back and I'm going to fish this about an inch or two over depth and just sort of run, run a caster or a couple of, of maggots over the top of the ground bait, so that's, that's my positive rig on that line, so I've got the Olivet there as you can see and one heavy dropper. On the three metre whip, I'm going to be running that over the same line, exactly the same sort of rigs, but a gram float in this case. And as you can see, I've just got three number 10 droppers spaced out in the bottom of the rig. I'm going to fish this about an inch and a half off the bottom. So if there's a few smaller fish, more sort of dace, and I'm just looking to catch just the small fish in the peg with a bit more finesse in the presentation, this is what I'll use. So in terms of that, I've got a slightly lighter hook length and, uh, and hook in this case. I've got 010 fluorocarbon and a size 18 Colmic Nuclear N957 on there. So a little bit lighter, again, fishing a bit more through the water because there's not a lot of pace on the river. So that's the whip line looked at. And like I said, I'm gonna kick that off by just chucking in a tiny little nugget of ground bait, looking to try and feed after every one, two, three, maybe five fish, depending on how many are down there. So that's, the, that's going to be my opening plan. And then I've got two rods set up. I've got a bomb rod. Again, they're not easy to show with the, the peg. And I've got a stick float rod. The stick float rod, nice and nice and light, but I've slightly stepped up just in case we do hook a bonus chub or a few better fish. So I've got an 016 mainline, 012 fluorocarbon hook length rather than the usual 010, and an 18 B560. I've just got a four before a four number four um, Drennan alloy stick on there. And as you can see, strung eights and then a couple of number tens down towards what is probably about an eight-inch hook length, so not too long. Um, like I say, quite a positive rig because I've got the shot rather than all the way up the rig, sort of in the bottom third. And that's purely because there's, I want to try and get the bait down. And like I say, if, if I'm loose feeding, you get a few bleak in this river. And if you don't have fish a positive rig and get the bait down, you could end up getting pestered by them. So I'm just looking for a few decent, possibly roach dace, like I say, even the odd chub if I can get one out on this, on this rig. Finally, I've just got a bomb rod set up. <laughs> Again, this, this is more in line with sort of catching some big chub under the tree, so I've really geared this one up. I've not put a lead on just yet, because I'm going to have to sort of play around and find the lead size that holds correctly in this, in this river. I suspect it's probably about a half ounce when it's flowing like it is today. But what I've gone for on this is an 11 foot Mava power light, a one ounce tip in the end, so fairly soft. But in terms of the actual line of the hooks, I've gone for an eight pound main line, an 015 hook length and a size, size 12 Drennan Super Specialist hook, so nice and heavy 
twizzle boom on there. Like I say, I'm just going to clip a, a half ounce sort of flat bottom lead onto that. And like I say, probably fish that in the last hour, last couple of hours of the session, looking for a bonus fish to complete the day. So that's my plan of attack. So what I'm going to do now is get a, a nugget, a couple of nuggets of ground bait prepared, start chucking those in over that three and a half metre whip line. And then, like I say, judge the session from there. I'll put a bit of hemp down, downstream, but just loose feed that very sparingly to start with. And then when I look to go on it, I'll up the feed and try and, like I say, try and force the fish to settle in an area where I can catch them. So that's the plan of attack. So I'm going to get that ground bait prepared now and start the session. Right, so I'm now ready to start the session. So I'm going to go for the first run through with the whip, starting on the three metre whip. I'm just going to make up the odd little nugget of ground bait and start feeding it. And I'm going to feed quite a general area and try and draw fish that way. That was a little indication straight away. And there we go. A little gudgeon to start off with. A tiny little indication. But hopefully when we get a little bit of bait in the peg, we'll start drawing a few better fish. I'm going to feed probably every first, every couple of fish to start off with. Just try and build an area to fish. Hopefully, just sort of get the fish used to balls of ground bait going in. Again, each little nugget's probably got about 15 or 20 sort of food particles, the odd grain of hemp, the odd dead maggot and the odd caster. Again, once I've built, built an area of feed, if it becomes apparent that they're not they're not really responding to the ground bit, then I can always change to loose feeding maggots and casters or hemp. But ideally I want to try and catch the fish on ground bit so I can just get them pinned down in one spot and catch them as quickly as possible. A little indication there. I've made sure when I'm whip fishing like this, I've plumbed up really, really carefully. So I know exactly what the contours of the, the riverbed are in front of me. And as you can see, there's a bit of a downstream wind today, which there's a bite and another fish. Another, another nice gudgeon. Like I was saying, sorry, if, um, if you're fishing on a whip like this, you need to be really careful when you're plumbing up, make sure you Make sure you understand exactly what the layout of the riverbed is in front of you, because that'll tell you where your ground bait's ending up. So I know in this peg where I'm fishing, it sort of shelves up to the to the right or the downstream side of me, which is um, pretty much what you want really when you're putting in ground bait and fishing on a whip, because it means that bait's going, it's basically going to congregate in that area. Go, another good gin. Decent size, but ideally what I want to be trying to do is build a peg of dace. I think what I'll do is nip the barb down on this, on this hook a little bit more, just to speed up the unhooking process. Again, it's something when you're whip fishing that you do want to use where you can, is a barbed hook but just nip the barb down. What it stops, especially when it comes to catching dace, it stops them sort of wriggling off the hook especially when you're swinging them in and to your chest you can obviously have have the line go slack at points and with a barbless hook it'll just drop straight out whereas with a, a barbed hook that was a bite with a barbed hook wave just nip the barb down a little bit just gives you that extra purchase on the fish so they don't drop off when you're trying to unhook them or sort of swing them to hand another indication
Well, that's a better fish. Little chublet this time. Lovely little fish that. As you can see, it's a brilliant way of catching this, especially in a venue like this where there's plenty of pike. With a stick float, you'd be playing the fish in and sort of dragging them over the surface a lot more than you do with a whip. That's good that the stamp of fish has already gone up. So I expected a few gudgeon early in days, but if we're getting little chublets and there's another fish. What's this this time? Another little chub. No, sorry, that's a dace actually this time. These are what we want to be catching. So after feeding sort of five or six little nuggets of ground bait, we've already started to catch a slightly better stamp of fish. These will usually the gudgeon, once a better stamp of fish moves in, the gudgeon will disappear. So we can get a few dace and little chublets like that, maybe the odd roach, soon on for a decent weight. There you go, as I said, that another decent gudgeon. And hopefully as the fish start to get into a bit of a frenzy, what I'll be able to do is try and catch several fish on the same sort of bus maggot, if I can get away with it. Again, once they get into a feeding frenzy, because there's that many fish in this river at times, you can get away with fishing, like I say, an absolute skin of a maggot on the hook. Another bite there. As you can see that ground bit, it's fizzing up right in front of me and that's just where that, the riverbed starts to shelve up there. That one's just come off. Look like a little dace that. Again, once they start feeding more aggressively, you tend to get much better hook holds. It's a good start already, as you can see with that ground bait, I'm squeezing it fairly firm and it's going straight down to the bottom. A little good in that. It's just doubled the maggot over the hook point. We'll see if we can get away with carrying on using that hook bait. The other thing that you'll notice that I'm doing is when I'm putting the olivette in, I'm trying to get the float to drop straight on top of the olivette and that just makes the rig sit a lot quicker rather than swinging the olivet right out into the middle of the river and waiting for it to come back under. Just swing it out there and letting the float drop straight into the rings that the, the olivet's made. You can see it cocks straight away. And that's the reason why we use heavy rigs when we're fishing on, on the whip like this. Another nice little day that. And we'll see how many fish we can catch on the same hook bait this time. So once it gets to this sort of point, this is when you want to try and sort of develop a rhythm, get used to feeding after say one, two fish, three fish or whatever, whatever seems best at the time. So he's taking the bait well down that little dace. So that's three fish on the same maggot there that's properly bust. I don't think it'll be long as well before I start looking to move on to that heavy rig, that gram and a half. But this is working nicely for the time being. So once the fish get really confident, that's when I'll move up to that heavier rig with a much bigger hook. And the other thing when you're whip fishing on a river like this, it's important to keep the, the whip nice and high. There's a little indication there, another fish. Keep the whip nice and high and crucially, 
keep in contact with the float at all times. So I'm pretty much holding the float up just a little bit, sort of as if you were stick float fishing, but much more direct. But it's really good that on a, such a clear river that's barely flowing, the fish are responding to this tactic. Again, I wasn't 100% certain when I started fishing it today whether the ground bait would, would work. But we certainly started quite well with it. Again, it's more something that works when the river's up and coloured, especially in the middle of winter, when you get a lot of fish that are pushing right underneath you in the slacks in, in the peg, you can get a really good weight out because the fish are pretty much holed up in one area. And you can see how slowly that float's making its way through the peg. I think we need a fresh bait on that. I'm starting to see the odd fish topping in the peg as well. So that's one of the reasons why I want to use ground bait is to make sure they get down to the bottom and stay down there so I can use really positive rigs to catch them. Absolute sail away bite that, missed it. Get that rig set properly. I say if I was loose feeding now, using rigs like this, I'd, I'd suffer with plenty of missed bites and possibly even foul hooked fish if I had lots in the peg. And I much prefer when I'm trying to catch a big weight of fish, especially on a river like this, is to try and nail them down in one spot and fish really positive rigs that set really quick. It's a much more efficient way of catching. Again, if you're spending ages using a, a nice sort of strung out rig, then you're having to wait for that float to settle. An indication there. Whereas with a rig like this, it sets immediately and it's fishing straight away. So if you've got a lot of fish in front of you, that's a slightly better fish. A little chublet. Probably have swung him. Like I was saying, with um, with fishing light rigs, you're having to wait for them to set, and you can miss a lot of bites. So with a rig like this, it sets immediately, and as soon as it goes anywhere near your ground baited area, then the the hook bait's in the correct place. Again, there'd be no point feeding like this with ground bait and fishing a light strung out rig. And equally, there'd be no point loose feeding and fishing with a positive rig like this. We're doing all right, considering we've had three species of fish already. We'll try and get away with using that same maggot again. So you can already see the effectiveness in this. And hopefully as the day draws on, I wouldn't expect to catch on this for the full six hours that we're fishing today. It's a slightly better day, so that one. I say, if, I wouldn't expect to catch on, on this all for the whole six hours that we're fishing today. But the fish I find, especially on a river like this when it's clear, they don't tend to sort of disappear completely out of the peg, they seem to move down and that's why hopefully later on in the day we'll use some running line tactics and try and chase them down the peg. In this first half, what I want to do is try and build a, as much of a weight as I can of these dace and little chublets and, and gudgeon. Again, try and draw as many fish into the peg to start with. And obviously, small fish will eventually draw bigger, bigger fish into the peg with the activity and hopefully catch those bigger fish on running line tactics later on. Again, wouldn't really stand much of a chance if we hooked a, a chub of two, three pound on this. I'm very happy with how the session started. Again, catching a real variety of sizes and species of fish. That's what makes this such a great method. It's not particularly selective. Depending on what you do want to catch, so if you were going to step up and try and fish for bigger fish, you could obviously 
even put sort of pellets and various other baits in your ground bait, sort of feed them or fish mill based mix or something like that. So you've got loads of options with this. But crucial when the river's down like this, you need to fish a, well, feed as dark a mix as you can because you're going to be feeding a lot of ground bait. You don't want to create a huge area where the bottom's basically pale and the fish can be seen by predators like pike. So by feeding the dark ground bait, it gives the fish a little bit of security. Anything, any ground bait mix that's sort of darker than the riverbed is what you want to try and do when it's, like I said, when the, the river's as, um, as clear as this. Loads of indications now, so as I say, I don't think it'd be long before we go into that gram and a half rig, just fishing a single dropper. So now that I've established a nice little bed of feed, what I'm going to try and do is feed after every two fish. Another little chub like that, it's much smaller, it's taking the bait well down. Interesting, when I fish this, this peg in winter, I think what we'll do, we'll put a, a link in the description to the video where we did fish on, sorry, a peg probably about 20 yards downstream with a similar method. When we fished that day, all we caught was dace. I think we might have had one or two roach from memory, but we didn't get any chublets or anything like that. And we didn't get any gudgeon either. So that's quite an interesting point. I think with it being a slower peg, days tend to prefer more pacey, shallower water with a bit more oxygen in it. So I suspect when it was in winter and the, like I say, the river was properly running through, those sort of days were more, more inclined to feed. Whereas today, we've had a, probably three or four little chublets now. So another little miss bite that. And you can see just how quick it is from the bite happening to the fish being in the keep net. Again, when you've had a bit of practice at this, you can become very efficient and really put a weight together. But it's amazing if you just keep ticking over Fishing like this for a two, three hours, it's amazing the weight you can put together. I say it's all about achieving a rhythm. I'll try and catch one more fish and then feed. That one's just come off. Again, one thing that happens a lot when you're catching, especially small days, is they do, do double the maggot over the hook point, which can be a real pain. So in cases like that, it can be better to either hook the maggot really crudely or even thread the maggot up the hook shank. Again, there's a lot of little, little tweaks and things you can do to try and speed up the rate at which you're catching when you're whip fishing like this. I think it's been a while since I've fed so I'll feed again. Another little chub, that one. So I think what we'll do now is we'll just crack on fishing with this rig and then we'll do another segment when I move on to that heavier rig, like I say, when I, I really get the fish going. But as you can see, already we're off to a great start. The first sort of 10, 15, 20 minutes of the session, we've caught plenty of fish and we're getting plenty of bites. So like I say, we'll crack on now and then we'll update you when we move on to that heavier rig and start catching a few more. Right, so a quick update now, as you can see, I've got my fleece on because it's cooled down a little bit. But what's happened is basically, we've had quite a few fish on that short line or the shorter of the two whips and they just seem to have backed off a little bit. It's gone a bit funny. There could have been possibly a pike in the peg or something, but it, they just seem to have gone unsettled and the bite's really tailed off. So what I've decided to do now is go a little bit further out, fish a bit more of a positive rig, like I say, that, that gram and a half, and just see if there's a few better fish off the edge of that. Again, on rivers like this, especially when it's, when it's um, low and clear, the fish or the bigger fish will tend to go into that slightly deeper water. So 
hopefully by going a little bit further out, fishing a slightly bigger hook bait and a more positive rig, still feeding the same. Hopefully we might be able to pick off one or two bigger dace or chublets or roach even. So again with a heavier rig I'm, I'm able to just control it a little bit more so hold it back, a little indication there straight away. And sort of just try and get the bait to trip bottom if I can. But interesting, like I say, what happened on that, that three metre line, or well, three metre whip, that's a better fish. Is we started getting a load of gudgeon. And like I say, usually they're the first fish on the bait, or the smaller fish like that are. But as soon as you get any sort of chub or dace, they tend to move out of the way. So you can, you know, pretty well for certain that when the gudgeon are in and you're catching one after the other, that the dace and chub have moved out. Like I say, with the clear water, I think either a, a pike's come in and spooked them or they've just backed off the feed. So by having a slightly longer whip set up like this, I can just chase the fish a bit further out, fishing slightly deeper water. It's only probably six in inches deeper, that extra two foot further out. But again, that can make all the difference when the river's low and clear like this. So I'm going to stick to the same feeding regime because it seems to have worked. And just try and pick off one or two better chub or or dace. Like I say, I've, I've geared up for this, so just in case we hook sort of a, a half pound or pound chub, that's why I've gone for the, the Drenham wide gate match as a choice of hook. Getting that, like I say, a nice wide gate, so it's perfect for swinging fish to hand, but it's a much heavier gauge hook than the, uh, the Colmic hook that I've got on the other rig. There we go. That's a better stamped dace already. <laughs> Again, it's become very apparent today that you can't really get away with using a bust maggot. I could earlier on get in the odd gudgeon, but as the fish have been caught and they've become a little bit more wary, I'm having to try and present a bait perfectly to them. So slowing the bait down, holding it on a tight line and making sure I'm getting the bait just to trip bottom and act as naturally as I can do is, is absolutely paramount. Again, when the river's up and coloured and sort of in flood conditions, if you like, and the fish are right underneath you, you can get away with incredibly crude rigs. It's a small fish, little little chub like that. You can get away with incredibly crude rigs, fishing a bulk directly above a hook length. You don't really need to slow the bait down, you can just run the float at the fish and you're not having to plumb up quite as accurately. Whereas when they, they like I say, they're getting plenty of time because of the pace, but equally they can see the, the rig and the hook bait really clearly. So you've got to make sure that you're fishing, like I say, is, as accurately and with as much finesse as you can when you're fishing like this. And it's common knowledge that when the river's low and clear that those are pretty much the hardest conditions to fish in. Doesn't mean that the fish aren't there, but you've got to really think about your approach a lot more. Again, like I said earlier, coming down to your ground baits, making sure they're nice dark in colour, they're matching the bottom or, or darker than the bottom. <coughs> Picking your rigs setting up a slightly lighter rig than you normally would. I think Obliques had a go, that's on the way down. So all those, these little things can make a huge difference. So the other good thing about fishing a three and a half metre whip is I can actually follow the float down the peg a little bit further. So just try and pick off one or two fish that might have backed off the feed or possibly the odd wary fish that's sat beneath the ground bait. And quite often that's where you'll pick off the better fish. It's another nice gudgeon that. And you can see a really big gudgeon on the nid, these lovely colours to them. I've tried the caster as well, but that's not really produced. Um, not sure why, but I think the maggots or the live maggots, as opposed to the the casters and the dead maggots that are in the ground bait, they just stand out a little bit more. That sort of movement, I think, just attracts the fish a little bit better. 
you know, when you're fishing on the whip, you're not looking to catch quality fish as, as such. You're trying to catch absolutely everything that's in your peg. So you don't want to fish a hook bait that's too selective. Again, if I was getting absolutely plagued by bleak or really tight in your gudgeon, that's when I'd probably go to the caster. But in an instance like this, like I say, you're trying to just catch everything that's in front of you as quickly as you can. So there's no real virtue in, in fishing sort of baits like heads of a dendrobina or casters or anything too fancy. The other thing that's worth pointing out as well is the fact that because the fish haven't been quite as as obliging when it comes to feeding, I've not really been able to get a rhythm going. So that's a little bleak, is that? So I'm more feeding according to time, so I'm trying to feed every sort of 30 seconds to a minute rather than per fish, because it could be, again, because like I say, they're being quite skittish. If I wait for two fish, it could be 10 seconds to catch two fish, or it could be two, three minutes. So I'm just making sure I keep that bait going in regularly. Nice little dace, that one. Okay, making sure I'm changing the maggots each time. Like I say, in flood conditions, I'd just make sure that the hook point was clear and there was something on the hook and then I'd be straight back in. It's amazing the difference it's made to go from that sort of three metre line to three and a half metres. There's a lot more fish out there. I'm getting a lot more indications now, even fishing a heavier rig. See if I'm just about swinging. That's a cracking fish. That's a really good dace, is that? Probably four or five ounces. Those are the stamp of fish you want to be catching. Is just about swingable. Like I say, we're fishing a much bigger and heavier gauge hook. I've been able to swing that fish to hand. If I was fishing on the, the three metre whip with that size 18 Colmic hook, that fish would have come off so I'd, I'd have had to net it. So if I'm catching, or if I was in an instance where I was catching fish really quickly and catching a lot of those stamper fish, little decisions like that can make a huge difference at the end of the day. I'd lose a lot less days, let's say fishing a heavier hook like this than I would on that lighter rig. As you can see, days like that sort of size are worth two or three of the gudgeon that I was catching on the three metre line, on the three metre rig. Again, so I'm going to keep up the feed, making sure I'm, I'm putting plenty of casters and hemp and dead maggots in the mix. just concentrating on that float a lot more. Little indication there. You can see it's a fantastic method to fish on, on rivers is this. Like I say, it's not perfect conditions for it. But you can see even when the rivers, or the rivers should be fishing really hard, it's been incredibly productive and we've had plenty of bites, plenty of fish. And you're making the most on a whip like this of the fish that are in front of you when you start the session. Sort of, it's a similar. I think of it in a similar way to when you're fishing bread punch on the canal. It's a very instant method, so you'll catch as much as you can really quickly, make the most of the, f of the fish that are in front of you before you spook them. So you're just concentrating really hard, keeping a nice tight line to the, the float, striking any little indication. And we've not had many sort of fly under bites today, so it's been quite important to have that float dotted down. And when, when the river's as it is, you can get away with dotting the float down a lot more because not having all sort of the boiling and swirling that you get in, in flood conditions in winter. What I've also done as well is tried to spread the bait out a little bit more. When I'm throwing it in, 
rather than throwing it directly on the float, which I could do if I wanted. I'm trying to create a much bigger area so I can pick fish off from around that. Again, if you try and sort of nail them all in exactly one place and keep putting your balls of ground bait down one hole, you're pretty much limiting your options then. If the fish do spook and move sort of a metre, two metres away, they're not going to be feeding on the same sort of baits that you're putting on your hook. So it, be it becomes a bit obvious then that your hook bait's a hook bait rather than just a loose offering. So again, little things like that can, can be really important. I say when the conditions are really sort of like flood conditions, there's a lot of swirling and boiling, I prefer to put all the ground bait down one hole because it will start sort of spread itself out anyway a little bit. So I think what we'll do, we'll carry on fishing with this heavier rig, try and get a few more fish out. I might even try and push the peg a little bit more. So I was a shot to nothing before I go on the stick float. But we'll keep you updated if we start hooking a few fish in a row or whether we start getting a few better quality fish. Again, what I might have to do is possibly even switch back to that three metre whip. Again, just try and alternate between the two until I think that the peg's absolutely dead and that's when I'll go onto the stick float or the bomb. So like I say, we'll crack on with this now and then update you if we start getting into a run of fish or start hooking a few better, better fish as well. Right, so an update now that we're sort of two hours and 10 minutes into the session or two and a quarter hours nearly. And it's finally started to die off as this whip line. I've tried to push the peg, had a couple of better, a couple of decent days on it, but bites just seem to have dried up. So I've cut down on the feed a bit um, and tried running a rig about a foot off bottom or six inches off bottom over the top of it. And like I say, it doesn't look like there's many fish there at all. I'm getting the odd little indication, but apart from that, nothing really to strike at. So I'll just see and make sure that there's, there's no sort of bonus fish down there. So I'll run it through another sort of six or seven times and just see if, uh, like I say, if there's a bonus fish down there that spooked them, but I suspect that this line's pretty much done now. Like I say, I've caught plenty of fish on it. I've tried back again on that three meter line and the same problems. That, the same problem is there. There's, there just don't seem to be the fish there. I think what they've done is because I've caught quite a few and made quite a bit of disturbance, they eventually just backed off and moved down the peg. Again, I've seen a few more fish rising further down as well. So that sort of, confirms what I'm what I'm thinking that the fish have just moved away from the feed it could be a pike's moved in but I, I suspect a lot of it's down to the disturbance and the noise and the fact that when you do catch quite a few fish in clear water that they do um, they do generally back off a lot quicker because they can see the other fish being caught so I'm just going to take a an inch or two off the depth with this and like I say just see if there's a, a better fish down there Like I say, what this should do is then bring us to pretty much the towards the end of this first first um, part of the, the session that we're doing today, so the first episode. Like I say, from what what we've managed to do in the first two hours of the session on the whip's really good. We've caught plenty of fish, we've had five or six different species, we've managed to catch a perch and a, a little roach as well, a couple of bleak, plenty of dace, quite a few little chublets and uh, plenty of gudgeon as well. So we've, like I said, we're starting to build a decent little weight. That was an indication there. But crucially with the whip, like what we've demonstrated, is making the most of the fish that are in front of you straight away when you start fishing. And you've seen how quickly we've been able to catch in spells. Again, I, th I certainly think if the conditions were a bit more favorable, like the, the river being up by another foot or two, a bit more color in the water, I think we'd have really caught consistently on this line and probably made it last for maybe three, four hours possibly. But as it's happened today with the clear conditions, I think the fish, have, like I say, have just spooked after a while and I've certainly pushed the peg. I've tried to try and catch a, a few better fish, tried to put a lot of bait in, look for those bonus fish. And it has produced one or two decent dace and a slightly better chublet as well. But the fish certainly haven't turned up in numbers and settled at any point. Like I said, we've caught in spells and then it's gone quiet, caught a few goods and then the dace and chub have come back. And we've just sort of put, put a little bit of a weight together that way. But I think what I'll do is call this the last run through on this, on this line. 
there we go probably call that the last fish tiny little uh, tiny little chub like that so we'll get him unhooked and popped in the net and like I said we'll round up this this first in tiny little fish there so my plan of attack in the second episode like I say part two of this six hour stint that we're doing on the nid today I'm going to fish the bomb and the stick float down the peg hopefully look for a few better fish get plenty of bait in and like I say make the most of those fish that have now backed away from the the whip line so what I'll do is pop this to one side and like I say we'll conclude it at that so keep your eyes out for the next episode from this session today and as always thanks for watching don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you on the next one